Good morning and welcome to worship at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. So good to see everybody. Let's all stand together as we sing this wonderful hymn, In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fear I'll sing. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, full is the God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till all the grateful you've come out to be a part of our service this morning. I know that with the holiday weekend, 
And with the game away last night and maybe even a little bit of the outcome of the game may have affected some folks' attendance, but I see that you are here and I am grateful that you've come to be a part of the service here this morning. These folks that have come today, they are declaring to you publicly that they have trusted in Christ and in Christ alone for their salvation. And uh, we are so excited about how God has saved so many over these last several weeks and uh, to see the baptismal water stirred. Church, truth is, is that between last Sunday and this Sunday, we will have had the privilege to baptize 24 souls. And we praise the Lord for that. Amen. All right, we got our first young lady, Natalie, you come on. Natalie, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Next, we have Kendall. Take your time. Kendall, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Finally, we have Jaden. Jaden, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and now in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen, church. Isn't God good? We're just going to continue to celebrate that this morning. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Miss Lisa if she'd come on forward. This is Miss Lisa Floyd. And about a month ago, she trusted Jesus as her Savior. And we are so thankful for her and her decision. So Miss Lisa, based on your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Miss Lisa got saved not long ago and her daughter Lily, when we got back from beach camp that Sunday, she made a profession of faith and was saved also. So we get to baptize a, mo a mother and a daughter today and we're celebrating that. And so Lily, yeah, give it up for them. This is a good day. So Lily, based on your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Up next is Miss Molly Wiley. She got saved at beach camp not long ago. Molly, based on your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Up next is Noah Pettit. Noah trusted Jesus a while back, and we were able to talk not long ago, and he was able to understand what baptism really means, that it is a public profession of his faith. And so we celebrate with you, Noah. Slide on back a little bit, there you go. So Noah, based on your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. last candidate is Tate. Tate is a fourth grader and at Awana this past week, 
Oh, he had been talking with his dad at night. They'd been reading through the scriptures together and he had had a lot of questions. So at Awana, we were able to talk through what salvation means. And after that conversation, he went home and just in his room there, um, just at home, he just prayed to receive Christ as his Lord and Savior. So we celebrate that as well. So Tate, based on your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Church, as we celebrate this and as we worship our risen Savior, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. And we're going to continue to sing. Before we do that, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace. God, we thank you so much for the decisions that were made for all of these folks and the people over the last couple of weeks that have gotten their baptism on the right side of their conversion. Lord, we thank you that Jesus has risen. We thank you that our faith and our salvation is in Christ alone. And we pray that today, Lord, you would save more folks and that you'd be with this time of worship. Lord, we love you so much and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Is anybody here glad you're saved this morning? Amen. Praise God. There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood of God's sin. Since then I walk in forgiveness All of my guilt was erased The chains of the past Are broken at last I got saved And oh, I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of yes, I am. God. That's a reason to praise God this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you. What a beautiful name it is that we're saved by. Amen. The name of Jesus. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You're hidden. 
it, church. What a beautiful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The scriptures tell us that there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be, must be saved. But at the name of Jesus, demons flee. At the name of Jesus, the saved are lost. At the name of Jesus, amen. What a powerful name it is. Let me say again, welcome to you this morning. Thank you so much for being here with us on a holiday weekend. I am so grateful that you've come to worship and I pray we would do so today in spirit and in truth. If you're visiting today, we wanna to invite you to stop by one of our welcome centers on your way out. Fill out a connect card. We've got a small gift of appreciation for you being here in the service with us this morning. And then don't forget, we will not have service tonight. We'll see you back here at 6.30 on Wednesday. And then let me also say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, church, for your faithfulness and your giving last Sunday. What an absolutely wonderful day we had. And I believe it is going to be possible, Lord willing, that we pay this building off by the end of this calendar year. Amen. Isn't God good? Go ahead. Thank you so much for your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a special treat today. One of my best friends in all the world, Brother Mike Stone is here to share the Word of God with us this morning. And we had a great time of fellowship last night. He enjoyed it a little more than I did, but uh, we did have a great time of fellowship. Amen. And uh, I am so grateful, Brother Mike, that you're here and his lovely wife, Andrea, is with us this morning. And we are grateful that she was able to uh, come and make the trip with him. Uh, Mike is a regular here. We love him so much. And it was really enlightening to me, Brother Mike. I'd never thought as often as you've been here, you, you and Andrea have done our uh, marriage conferences. Brother Mike has been at every Bible conference that we have had. It struck me that he had never been here on a Sunday. And so I'm grateful that you're here to hear him this morning and a challenging message from the Word of God. Would you now, as we pray, would you just prepare your heart to receive the Word of God this morning? It is a powerful Word, and it's a Word that will, that will cause us to take some inventory, or better yet, allow the Holy Spirit to take some inventory of where we are. And so I pray that you'd be prepared to receive the message. But before we do, uh, we're going to sing, or these ladies are going to come sing one of my favorite, all-time favorites, Still I Will Praise You. And I don't know what you may be walking through this morning. I don't know what difficulty is behind you or what difficulty may lay ahead of you. But in spite of all of that, God is still good. He's still gracious. And in the midst of difficulty, still I will praise you. Maria Tyre is holding her own. She is off the ventilator. She is uh, making a little bit of recovery each and every day. And I just want to say, Brother Dale, what a blessing you've been to me through this. I'm trying to minister to he and his family and to his wife and He's been ministering to me every day. Been in church every time the doors have been open. And Brother Dale, we thank God for his answered prayers, brother. And we pray God's continue, continue to strengthen her body. And Faith Ann, I don't know if she's here this morning. She begins some uh, treatments this week. And we've got an answered prayer request sitting over here to my left, Brother Brian Goldsmith. Uh, amen. We serve a good God, amen? We serve a prayer answering God. We serve a powerful God, amen? What a wonderful name it is. We're gonna pray and then we're gonna sing and then Brother Mike's gonna come and share the word of God with us. And I pray that you would leave today challenged and changed by the word of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for what we have already heard this morning. And God, I pray for these dear ladies as they come and sing, Lord, would you touch them, Heavenly Father? And I pray, Lord, we would receive the message of the hour today. Lord, we would take seriously the warning. We would take seriously, Lord, the word that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When the 
come to give honor and worship and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ whose name is above every other name and who alone is worthy of our worship and our praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Kim, Valerie, Heather. What a tremendous blessing we've had today. Um, years ago, I don't know how many years ago it was when I first heard the Roops sing, I had no idea that one of the sweet graces that God would bring into my life and my precious wife's life would be the blessing to not only call you sisters, but friends as well. Thank you so much. You've encouraged and strengthened my heart with your music this morning. 
And Brother Chad and Miss Stacy, thank you for your hospitality. Mount Pisgah, you have no way of knowing, unless you've recently come from a dead and dying church, you have no way of knowing how blessed you are by the wonderful pastor and pastor's wife and the entire church staff the Lord has given to this church. You are blessed beyond measure and words. And before I even get to my text, can I just say for the many guests that are here today, perhaps the Labor Day weekend travels, having uh, tomorrow off from work has let you spend maybe some time out of town here in Easley, South Carolina. Or maybe you're here because you're observing one of the many baptisms that we saw earlier in the service. If you live in this area and you don't have a church home, I would be willing to move my family here. If I were not in ministry myself, I'd move my family to Easley, South Carolina just to be a part of what God's doing at Mount Pisgah. And there may be something stirring in your heart. You're not even a follower of Jesus Christ. You're here at the invitation of a friend. Well, I want you to know what you are sensing and what you are experiencing is people who have been transformed by the soul-changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're just expressing a great big collective thank you to a God who loved us so much that he died on the cross, rose from the dead, forgives us of our sin, reconciles us to our heavenly Father, and gives us the promise of abundant life in this life and eternal life in the life to come. We've just come to Say thank you to a God who's done for us more than we could have ever asked or imagined. And he can do that for you and for your family today. You're in the right place this morning, even though you've got to listen to a Georgia bulldog preacher today. Now, I don't want to quench the spirit but I don't want to say much about the game last night. I will point out that for the last seven or eight years, it has been my custom when I preach a funeral that if there is a way that I can wear a necktie that connects me to the dead and the dying, I will do that. I'll, it's the tragic death of a child. I may wear a cartoon character tie. If it's a veteran, I'll wear a U.S. flag tie. And in this case, I just thought I'd wear a little Clemson orange this morning and bring my copy of the perfect Word of God. I do want to ask you in all seriousness to take your Bible and turn with me to the Old Testament and the book of Nehemiah. We'll have some fun this morning, but I want to ask you a question. Are you living near the wall? In Nehemiah chapter 13, we see the man of God confronts the people of God. They've been buying and selling on the Sabbath. And we're thankful that we do not live under the Old Testament law. But in their case, the, the buying and the selling on the Sabbath was an outward sign that they had inwardly strayed from a close fellowship with the Lord. And Nehemiah confronts them about their sin, and he drives the merchants outside of the city on the Sabbath day, and he shuts the gate, and he locks the door. But in Nehemiah chapter 13, we discover that the people of God are living too close to the wall. They are living as close to sin and rebellion as they can possibly be. And today's question from Nehemiah is very simple. Are you living near the wall? I heard the story of a man. He was an old browbeat, henpecked husband. Now, sir, don't look at your wife right there. That's not a smart thing to do. But on one occasion, that old, that old browbeating, domineering, henpecking wife, she died. And they picked out her favorite blue dress took her down to the local funeral home where they had a memorial service in the chapel. Her pastor preached from the 23rd Psalm. The music minister sang Beulah Land. And after the sermon, her three brothers and three brothers-in-law, the six pallbearers, came and picked up that casket and carried it down that narrow little aisle in that tiny little funeral home chapel. And when they got to the back of the chapel, they accidentally bumped the casket into the wall. And the jostling of that coffin, the jolt of that casket, they heard a moaning from inside the casket. 
And they opened up the lid, and that old domineering, mean-as-a-junkyard-dog wife had been revived by that bump into the wall. She went home, and for 15 more years, she browbeat that old boy nearly half to death. And then she died again. They went back to that same little funeral home, same little chapel, same preacher, preached the same sermon from the 23rd Psalm. Same music minister sang the same verses of Beulah Land, and the same six men came to carry that same casket down that same little narrow aisle. And when they got to the back of the building, that old henpecked widower jumped to his feet and said, Watch the wall, boys. Watch the wall. Well, in Nehemiah chapter 13, there is a wall that we need to pay much attention to, and it's not the wall at the funeral home. It's the wall of compromise. I ask you this morning from Nehemiah 13, are you living near the wall? If you're able and willing, I'll invite you to stand to your feet with an open Bible as we honor the public reading of God's inspired, infallible, and inerrant Word. In Nehemiah chapter 13, I'm beginning my reading in the 15th verse. If you have it, say, I've got it. The Bible says, In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses, here it is, on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves. That is, they were bringing in grain, and they were lading their donkeys and beasts of burden, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem here it is again, on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. And there dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, that is pots and pans and household goods, and sold them on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus and did not our God bring this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, underscore that, we'll come back to that before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gate should be shut and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates. There should be no burden that be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall. We'd say it like this in South Georgia. Why are you hanging out so close to the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. May God add a blessing to the reading of His Word as we bow in prayer together for just a moment. Father, the need of my heart, and I believe the need of this congregation collectively and individually, is the prayer that David offered in the 139th Psalm. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my faults. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. For our good, for the strengthening of this church, and for the ultimate glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we make our prayer, the people of the Lord said, Amen. Would you be seated, please? How far is too far? I was a teenager growing up in a little country Pentecostal church, in southeast Georgia when I first heard a member of our little youth group ask the youth leader that question, how far is too far? It was just guys there that night and the context with our age and knowing all the temptations of the flesh at that age, we all knew exactly what that question meant, how far is too far? 
the youth leader had enough of the power of God on his life to give this answer to the question. He said, I cannot give you a good answer because you're asking the wrong question. When you ask how far is too far, remember we're talking about hormonal teenagers. Everybody know what we were asking about? When you ask how far is too far, there's no good answer to that question because what you're asking is, how close can I get to sin? How close can I live to the world? How far can I get away from God and still be right with God? And he rightly said, I can't give you a good answer to that question. You're asking the wrong question. Nehemiah 13 would say, amen, amen, and amen. The eight verses that we read a moment ago tell the story of rebellion and sin and compromise. The people of God have been confronted about buying and selling on the Sabbath. The merchants have now been, as it were, locked outside the city, past the walls, through the gates, and the doors have been locked and bolted. But the merchants on the other side of the wall are living right by the gate. And the people of God are living right by the gate too. Nehemiah confronts them and says, you need to stop living so close to the wall. Now with that in mind, there are three simple truths that I want you to see from Nehemiah chapter 13. The first thing I want you to notice is the commandment that was rejected. This 13th chapter is just a list of different sins the people of God were committing. God had brought a great revival in the days of Nehemiah, but Nehemiah left town for several years. He went back to the the, the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians uh, on, on official business, and that's beyond the scope of this message. But when he came back to town, he found out that a people who had been walking with God had strayed from the Lord in a lot of different ways. And he begins to confront them line by line and sin by sin, and the people determine to get right with the Lord. But the one sin that we want to focus on this morning is the fact they were violating the laws of the Sabbath. There are two things that I want you to consider with me. First is the prohibition made by God. The prohibition made by God. For about a thousand years before these events God had carried Moses up the top of Mount Sinai and had given him the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And do you remember how the Decalogue began? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And what was the fourth one? You shall remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Because God created all that has been created in six days, and on the seventh day God rested. On that Sabbath day, He rested and declared it to be holy. And in light of that, Exodus chapter 20 now commands the people of God that six days you shall work. Boy, that's a message America needs to hear today. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall do no work. Not you, not your son, not your daughter, not any visitors you have at your house, not even your oxen or your donkey shall do any work on the Sabbath day. And Israel knew very well that was a commandment that had been made by God. They knew exactly what they were doing. Time out on the field. I don't know that I've ever met with anybody, talked to anybody, counseled anybody in my office whose life had been devastated and decimated by sin that did not already know what God had told them to do and not to do. I mean, let's be honest. You may be a visitor here this morning, and you don't know Jonah from Jeremiah. You don't know Matthew from Malachi. You know nothing or next to nothing about the the Word of God or the commandments of God, but you don't need a preacher to tell you that the Bible says you ought not be looking at porn on your iPhone. You don't need a preacher to tell you that if you made a commitment to your wife, you're to be with her and her alone. And ma'am, if you made a commitment to your husband, you're to be with him and him alone. 
Young people, you don't really need the preacher to tell you today that you are to obey and respect and honor your father and your mother. But particularly for the children of God, if you are born again, the Bible says that when you got saved, the Spirit of God came to take up residence in your heart. The Bible says of Christians that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is often said that in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. In the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. The Spirit of Almighty God took up residence in your heart the moment that you were saved. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, I believe it's in verse 9, the Bible says, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you are none of his. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. The spirit of the thrice holy God who is very discomforted in the presence, in the atmosphere of sin. We call that conviction. That's why when you take the spirit of God into a place where sin is present, words are being spoken that ought not be spoken. Things are being revealed that ought not be seen. Things are being done that ought not be done. Child of God, if the spirit of God is in you, he is very uncomfortable in that atmosphere of sin and he loves you too much to let you be comfortable in that atmosphere of sin. What I'm saying is you don't have to be the brightest bulb or the sharpest knife in the theological drawer to know right is right and wrong is wrong. You don't have to know chapter and verse to know that some things have just been prohibited by God. For example, several years ago, a man had been attending our church. He was well known in our little community of about 4,000 people. And everybody knew that for about 10 or 12 years, this middle-aged man had been living with a woman, not his wife, and we know all that goes along with that. Boyfriend and girlfriend, middle-aged, living together, unmarried. Well, they began attending our church. One Monday, he came by the office to tell us that the previous day on Sunday, he had prayed. He did what somebody in this room needs to do today. He had been convicted of his sin He knew for the very first time he could not save himself. And he called on the wonderful name of Jesus we've been singing about. And he asked Jesus to save him, to forgive him, and to wash his sins away. And I've got good news for you this morning that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And he found out that Jesus Christ is still in the sin-forgiving business. He said, I didn't make it public yesterday. What do I need to do? And a staff member that was speaking to him said, well, you need to come forward this next Sunday. Every disciple that Jesus called, he called publicly and called to make a public profession and follow the Lord in believers' baptism. And by the way, somebody in this room, in a group of this size, Brother Chad, some child of God in this room genuinely saved, but you've never been scripturally baptized, which is by immersion after your salvation experience. And so my staff member said, You need to come forward this Sunday and be baptized, and that's what he did. So this man who had been saved by his own testimony for seven days came forward, and he was baptized. Well, my phone started ringing on Monday morning. Preacher, did he join the church yesterday? You realize in South Georgia we say shacked up. You realize he's shacking. Can't be a member of the church in good standing shacking, by the way, that's good theology. I said, well, he's only been saved now for about eight days. Let's see what God will do. The next day, the old boy came by the office, spoke again to my associate pastor, and here was his question. What does the Bible say about living together, not being married? My staff member said, I asked him, Why do you ask? Why do you want to know? He said, because I've heard all my life that it was wrong, but it never felt wrong before. But it feels wrong now. What does the Bible say about it? And my staff member took down the blessed book of God and took him to 1 Corinthians 6, 18 that says, flee fornication. Took into Paul's letter to the Thessalonian believers that this is the will of God for you, that you abstain from immorality. 
And all the Word of God did was confirm and line up with what the Spirit of God was already saying to his heart. And I want to admonish someone here this morning, that stuff that you're doing, I don't know what it is, and I'm not going to give a list today. The, the Holy Ghost is better at making that list than I can be. But when the Spirit of God puts His finger on something that you're saying or doing or thinking or watching or whatever it may be, listen to Him. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is simply reminding you of the prohibition made by God. Now, to be clear, we don't live our life based on some inner feeling. We live our life based on the revealed authority of the Word of God. But God in His mercy loves you too much to let you feel right when you're doing wrong. The prohibition made by God. I want to say a second word, though, about the promise made to God. Now, you can study this later in the book of Nehemiah. If you go back to the 10th chapter, you don't have to turn there now, but this is not the first time that Nehemiah confronted them about violating the laws of the Sabbath. They were like modern-day Southern Baptists, up and down, off and on, in and out, hot and cold. Is anybody like today's preacher that when you confess your sin and promise God you're not going to do it anymore, that ain't the first time you've done that. It's like a vicious cycle. And we find ourselves along with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 where the blessed apostle said, the thing I ought not do, that's what I end up doing. And the thing that I ought to do, I end up not doing it. O oh, wretched man that I am. Well, Nehemiah had already confronted them in years past and they decided that they would make a commitment to God and wrote it down in a letter. We might call it a prayer journal or a daily devotional. Years earlier, they had written out a promise to God and said, we will no longer buy or sell on the Sabbath. And lo and behold, they are right back where they'd been. I want to say, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Hey, if this message is already bringing you under some sense of conviction about some sin of compromise in your life, I want you to know you're among friends this morning. You're in the right place because we all know what it's like to sin against the God that we say we love. There's the commandment that was rejected. The second main principle we see here is the confrontation that was recorded. This is going to be found now in verses 17 and 18. Nehemiah is moved by the Spirit of God to confront them. Verse 17 says, I contended with them. Now, that's a very strong word. Nehemiah got in their face. He got in their business. Now, Baptist folk don't like this kind of confrontation these days, but Brother Chad... He pulled his truck into their place of business and walked in and knocked on the door of their office, shut the door, and said, Hey, buddy, I just want to come see you. Can I talk to you for a minute? And he confronted them about their sin. He went over to their house and said, There's a story. I don't know if it's true or not, but word is that you're doing this or that you're not doing that, and I've come to confront you about your sin. By the way, thank God you've got a preacher who loves God and loves his word and loves God's people enough to confront you in your sin. But we live in a culture that would rather have milk toast, mealy mouth, weak kneed, limp wristed, so called preaching. You can fill up grand stadiums today if you'll just say nothing more or less than I'm okay, you're okay, I'm a winner, I'm a victor, you've got everything great, every day can be a Friday, here's how you can have joy every single day of your life, get you a big spinning globe and smile and tell everybody how life is wonderful. The problem is that's not being faithful to what this book teaches. Nehemiah contended with them about their sin. Charles Spurgeon speaks of this confrontation and said that we hear complaints that the minister speaks too harshly and talks too much of judgment. Look at this. Saved sinners never make that complaint. What I mean is that people who are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit never ever bristle 
at the biblical proclamation that God is holy and will not tolerate sin. Saved people, when they're confronted in their sin, don't get mad at the preacher. Don't get mad at their mama or their daddy. They get upset with themselves upset enough, if I could use that word, to turn from their sin and get right with their God. This confrontation was recorded. And Nehemiah brings up two simple things. His indictment is a two-point indictment. First, he references the disobedience of their fathers. Are you looking in verse 18 now? Did not your fathers thus... And did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? He's saying, guys, y'all have apparently forgotten something. The reason we had to rebuild the walls is because the walls were destroyed. The reason the walls were destroyed is because Jerusalem was overtaken. The reason Jerusalem was overtaken is because we came under the disciplining hand of God. God handed us over to Nebuchadnezzar. The reason God handed us over to Nebuchadnezzar is because our fathers and grandfathers were living in sin and rebellion. Now, their sin and rebellion of these people's ancestors manifested itself in a lot of different ways, but the primary way that it manifested itself that their fathers violated the laws of the Sabbath. If you know your Old Testament, you will remember this. God not only said that you should rest one day out of every seven. But to an agricultural society, he said, I want the land to lay fallow one year out of every seven. And God promised them, if you'll trust me and farm the land, years one, two, three, four, five, and six, year six, I'll make sure that it is a bumper crop enough to carry you through year six, Watch this, year seven and the first part of year number one of the next cycle until you take in the harvest. God said, if you'll trust me, I can do more with what you put in my hand than what you try to keep in your hand. By the way, that's a lesson somebody needs to hear today. Sir, God can do more with your marriage if you'll put it in the hands of God than if you try to handle it and take care of it yourself. Some weary parent needs to know today God can do more with your kids if you'll hand them over and put them in the hands of God. Lay them once again in the arms of the Lord Jesus. God can do more in a nanosecond by his power than us trying to handle our lives on our own. But the forefathers of these people did not honor God with what we would call the agricultural Sabbath. Remember, the land was to be uncultivated One year out of every seven. Watch this now. For 490 years, they disregarded that commandment. God said the land is going to lay uncultivated. And we can do this the easy way or the hard way. They violated that every seventh year commandment of God for 490 years. God took them off into captivity for 70 years. He said, the land is going to lie desolate and uncultivated 70 years one way or the other. By the way, our loving Heavenly Father, when He disciplines us, it's the same way you are with your kids. We can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. Son, you're about to get a bath. You're getting in the tub and you're getting in the bed. We can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. And God is giving a message of mercy today. And he's saying, don't live a life of compromise. Live as holy and close and clean as you can. Because I don't want to have to discipline you the hard way. I want to discipline you the easy way. Where you get dressed up and come to church and have some wonderful music, air-conditioned building, carpeted aisle, padded pew, smiling preacher to just tell you what I've said and you obey. Please do it the easy way. God says, I don't want to have to do it the hard way, but he loves us enough that he will. Nehemiah is simply reminding them, you're doing the same thing that our forefathers did that caused all this mess to start with. They had a problem with with a memory. I heard the story of some ladies who went to college and graduate school together. 
And when they finished with their advanced master's degree, they were 30 years old and decided they were going to celebrate by all going out to eat together, five or six young ladies. One of them said, where do you want to go eat? One of them said, well, let's go down to the seaside grill. Well, why do you want to go to the seaside grill? Well, it's because the waiters are studs and the view of the ocean is incredible. Ten years later, they were 40 years old. They said, let's get together for a reunion. Where you want to eat? Let's go to the seaside grill. Why do you want to go to the seaside grill? Well, because the waiters are cute and the view is good. Ten years later, they're age 50. Let's get together. Where you want to eat? Let's go down to the seaside grill. Well, why do you want to go to the seaside grill? Well, because the waiters are nice and the food is good. At age 60, let's get together again. Where do you want to go? Let's go to the seaside grill. Why do you want to go to the seaside grill? Because the waiters are fine young boys and the view is still pretty good. At age 70, let's get together again for a reunion. Well, where do you want to go? Let's go to the seaside grill. Why do you want to go to the seaside grill? Well, because they've got a wheelchair ramp and free coffee for senior adults. <laughs> Ten years later, at age 80, they unanimously decided they would meet again at the seaside grill because they wanted to try a brand new restaurant and none of them remembered ever eating there before. <laughs> Losing your memory is a bad thing, isn't it? I've had family members die with Alzheimer's, and earlier in my life we called it dementia and going senile and losing his mind. That's a terrible thing. It's an awful thing. I've watched it in the lives of family and church members, Pastor Chad. But let me tell you what I have seen in my own life and the lives of most of God's people. Spiritual amnesia. Spiritual Alzheimer's. Forgetting some things that have happened in the past. What do you mean, preacher? I mean, Nehemiah is reminding them, our forefathers acted the same way and it did not go well for them. And if you live a life of sin and compromise, it will not go well for you either. He confronts them about the disobedience of their fathers. He also confronts them about the discipline in their future. I'm still in verse 18. Look at it again. Did not your fathers do thus, and didn't God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? And yet ye bring, he, now you're doing the same thing. Do you see it? Ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Boy, I wish that every parent and grandparent in the building would sit up straight and pay extra close attention. He's reminding them we're in the situation we're in today because our parents and grandparents sinned against God yesterday. And if you understand that, then you'll realize there's some things we can do today that will devastate our children and our grandchildren and all the tomorrows of their lives. He's saying discipline is going to come in the future if we don't get right with the Lord. I was thinking about a story from the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, chapter 35. You remember Jacob was one of the most famous or infamous backsliders in the Old Testament. And in Genesis, chapter 35, God spoke to Jacob and said, I want you to arise and go back to Bethel. Bethel is the place where he'd gotten saved. I want you to get up from that, from that compromising position and get back to the place where you were saved. And maybe that's what you need to do this morning. Get back to that place in your life where when the preacher preached, your heart would be stirred. When the choir sang hot tears of worship and repentance would flow from your face. And when the altar call was given, you would be the first one on your face and on your knees before God. And you said, oh Lord, I want to live so close to you. Lord, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And maybe someone in this room today are watching by live stream. You need to get back to that place where your relationship was close with the Lord. And that's what God said to Jacob in Genesis chapter 35. I want you to get up and go back to Bethel. And Jacob turned and said to his family, change your clothes, get cleaned up, 
Give me those earrings out of your ears. And in that case, it was a symbol of connection to a pagan world. And he said, bring me all those idols and trinkets, all those false little, the, the statues to false gods. And, I, and by the way, he didn't take a vote about it. He didn't call a family conference. He acted like the God-called priest of his home, like the shepherd of his family. He acted like a godly man of the house. If you weren't a bunch of wusses, you men would be saying amen right now. Ask your wife, would it be all right if you said amen? And Jacob turned to his family, said, bring me all that stuff that symbolizes that we've been living a compromised life. And he took all those physical things, put it in a box, and the Bible says he buried it under an oak tree in the city of Shechem. Now, there are a lot of reasons I believe that he did that, but I want you to fast forward with me several centuries later. Israel had strayed from God once again, and they had spent centuries in Egyptian bondage. God brought them out under the leadership of Moses. God led them through the wilderness wanderings under the leadership of Joshua. And as they're about to go in and possess the promised land, do you remember in Joshua chapter 24, he said, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know where he made that promise? Joshua made that statement about serving the Lord in an oak grove at Shechem. Same place that Jacob had buried the trinkets of the world centuries earlier. Now, I cannot be dogmatic about this, but I, I personally believe that that's why Joshua gathered Israel there because they knew from oral history that that's where Jacob had made his commitment. And it's just another way of saying, guys, this isn't the first time that the nation of Israel has stood here and made this kind of commitment before. And if we don't keep the commitment that they did not keep, it'll go no better for us than it went for them. Sir, listen carefully. No man has ever cheated on his wife and it's gone well for him and you'll not be the first. Teenager, nobody has ever gotten addicted to pornography and had it be a blessing in their life and you'll not be the first. Ma'am, nobody has, no woman has ever been unfaithful to her husband and on the other side of it been right with God and thankful for their sin and you'll not be the first. And the list could go on and on and on and on. Nobody has ever violated the Word of God and had it go well for them. And beloved, you'll not be the first. Nehemiah confronts them about the disobedience of their fathers and the discipline that would be in their future if they didn't get right with the Lord. There's the commandment that was rejected. The confrontation that was recorded. Thirdly and finally, the commitment that was reinforced. Now, everything that I've been preaching up to this point is really just backdrop to this third point, which is really the sermon. So if you want to time the sermon, start timing me now. You can say, well, he preached a fairly short sermon, but he had a really long introduction. The commitment that was reinforced. Now, I don't use that word reinforced just because I need another R to go in my alliterated outline. But sometime back, I was on the backside of my shop. I've got a little woodworking shop where I keep all my tools and lawnmower and all that kind of stuff at my house. And on the backside of my shop, some years ago, I built just kind of a lean-to to have more space. And where those rafters come down and meet that support beam, our local building codes require, you guys know what I'm talking about, one of those metal little hurricane straps. Engineers have determined that down in coastal Georgia where I live, sometimes the winds get so high that a nail won't do. You got to reinforce that connection. And the reason I bring that up here is because I've been in a service like this before. And I've gone down to an altar and I've made a commitment. Listen to me now. And I meant it. Now, if you don't, get, if you don't understand that it was a sincere commitment, you'll miss the point. I mean hot tears, trembling lip, and a sincere heart. 
God, I promise you, I'm going to stop doing that. Lord, I commit to you, I'm turning from that. Lord, I promise you in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm turning from that sin. And sometimes the sun didn't set before I was right back at it again. So it could be that you need more than just a verbal commitment today. But you need to do some things that will reinforce that commitment. There are two of them that I find right here in this text. Number one, Nehemiah said in verse 19, there's no place for confusion. No place for confusion. Look in the 19th verse. And it came to pass when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath. Before the Sabbath. Would you say those three words? Before the Sabbath. He didn't wait until the Sabbath. Watch this. He didn't wait until the Sabbath to decide what he was going to do on the Sabbath. Before the Sabbath, he drove the merchants out had them shut the gate, lock the door, and he called some of the guards to come and stand guard down by the door. He didn't want anybody to have any question that he was serious about this matter. There was no place for confusion. I think it is also instructive that he made a decision today about what he was not going to do tomorrow. Did you hear what I just said? I said, did you hear what I just said? Now, this sermon will end faster if I don't have to do the preaching and the amening. I can do both, but it'll take twice as long. Did you hear what I said? He made a commitment today about what he was not going to do tomorrow. He had a made-up mind. But he knew enough about his mind to know that just saying I'm not going to do it tomorrow will not be enough. I'm telling you today what I'm not going to do tomorrow. And just to make sure, shut the gate, lock the door, put a guard down here by the door. Don't let any buyers go out the gate. Don't let any sellers come inside the gate because I'm making up my mind to reinforce my commitment. There'll be no place for confusion. He does some things to undergird his own commitment. He did something about what he was promising God. In our day, it could be someone who decides that alcohol has destroyed your life. It's ruined your job. Even now, it's devastating your family. And so just to make sure there's no confusion, you don't just come to the altar and say, God, I'm going to quit drinking. You do that, but you go home and you pour all that junk down the drain and flush it down the toilet. It's the man who says that pornography is destroying my life, but I promised God about that in the past, and it hasn't worked. So I'm going to promise it, and I'm going to get rid of my iPhone and get a flip phone. You say, I don't want to get a flip phone. I look like a fool. Ruining your family make you look like more of a fool. I'm talking about a man who says, I'm tired of hooking up with women down at the gym, so I'm not only going to make a commitment to God, but I'm going to cancel my gym membership. You say, well, I've got to do that to be in shape. You'd be better off to be fat than to lose your family. Amen goes right there. He's doing some stuff to reinforce his commitment. No place for confusion. Secondly and finally today, he has no plans for compromise. Look in the 20th verse. And the merchants and sellers of all kind of where lodged there without Jerusalem, that is right outside of Jerusalem, once or twice. And I testified against them and said to them, why lodge ye about the wall? They're, They're leaning on the wall hanging out down by the gate. And he says, why are you doing that? If you do so again, are you looking in verse 21? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Church, when Nehemiah said, if you, if you keep doing this, I'm going to come down there and lay hands on you, he ain't talking about anointing oil at a Benny Hinton crusade. <laughs> Pastor, he says, I'm going to whip you. I'm going to beat you up. 
Now, if you think that's not what the text means, after this service ends, read the rest of the chapter because he goes down there and snatches the hair out of some of their head, Brother Jeremy. <laughs> Nehemiah already got a hold of you, I can tell. <laughs> got you too, brother, didn't he? Yeah. Got a bunch of backsliders in this place, Brother Chad. Before this chapter is over, Nehemiah goes down there, snatches some hair out of their head, and takes his fist and beats them in the face. Don't try that, Brother Chad. This church will probably fire you. Nehemiah was serious. He says, you get away from that wall. I'm not going to have you tempting my people. Like a shepherd using his staff to drive off the wolves. What do you think would happen, Brother Chad, if you went and showed up at some old boy's workplace and said, I've heard a rumor that you're sleeping with one of the women in my church and you're about to bust up her family. And I'm telling you before God, I'm the, I'm the under-shepherd over that family. I'm going to be parked down the street from their house. If I see you pull up at her house, i got a GPS tracker on your truck. If I see you all over at the Hampton Inn, I'm going to beat you within an inch of your life. Get away from the people that I love. That's exactly what Nehemiah is doing. What I'm trying to tell you is he takes it as very serious business. He says, I don't want to make any plans for compromise. When I was a teenage boy, had my own vehicle, had a girlfriend, I wanted to go over to her house. And on one occasion, my parents found out that her parents were not going to be home. So my dad said that I couldn't go over there. You can't go over there if her mom and daddy are not at home. And I said, Daddy, you act like you don't trust me. And my daddy just said, it ain't an act. I mean, I ain't vying for an Oscar here. It ain't an act. I don't trust you. Then my daddy said, and I don't trust me. I don't trust myself. By the way, if you trust you, you don't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. The Bible says, give no occasion for the flesh. If you trust yourself too much to get in compromising situations, you're probably going to be the next person devastating your life and destroying your testimony, living down near the wall of sin. Nehemiah said, get away from the wall. If you stay down there living down there, you're just one step away from violating the Word of God. Are you living near the wall? I didn't ask you, were you a bank robber? A serial killer? An embezzler? I ask you, are you living near the wall? The story is told of a queen in medieval times, she was interviewing for a new chariot driver. She would travel around the kingdom in that horse-drawn chariot. For the interview, there were three candidates, and she only had one question she was going to ask them. Everybody that lived in that kingdom knew about a very high mountain with a dangerous cliff on the side of that mountain and many people through the years traveling through that narrow little passageway had fallen over the cliff to their death so her question was just one if you were my driver and I was in your chariot how much skill do you have traveling through that dangerous pathway how close could you get me to the edge of that cliff and still have confidence that we wouldn't go over. And the first driver, he stuck his chest out. Can you see him? Oh, my queen. I've got so much skill and expertise, no doubt in my mind. If my queen was in my chariot, I could get you within a half inch of the edge, and you'd be in no danger. The second candidate was listening at the door. He said a half inch, so he walked in and said... I've got so much skill. If my queen were in my chariot, I could get you within a quarter of an inch of the edge. And I have confidence you'd be in no danger at all. Third guy, he was listening at the door too. 
he came in and said, I've got so much skill, so much wisdom and experience. If my queen were in my chariot, I'd stay as far away from the edge as I could possibly get. The inside wheels would be scrubbing the side of the mountain. Who do you think got the job? Beloved, as we close, I just want to remind you, we don't carry around a queen, but we do represent a king. You say, preacher, where should I draw the line? Draw it as close to Jesus as you can get it. And don't live near the wall. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed just to remove distraction. Nobody getting up and moving around unless it's an absolute necessity. I want to ask you just a few questions and then we're going to stand and sing. Several times in this message today, I felt prompted of the Lord to invite lost people to be saved. Do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? You can be forgiven of your sin today. Every wrong you've ever done can be washed away through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are staff members and the pastor would love to take a few moments and spend in God's Word to share with you how you can know for a fact that you've been forgiven. If you're a first-time guest here, we're not asking you to join the church unless you want to. But do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? In about 30 seconds, we're going to stand to sing. And if you want to be saved, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Just tell the pastor, I need to be saved. The altar is also open if you need to bring some matter publicly to the Lord in prayer. We'll not think any less of you. We have no idea what you're coming to pray about or even who you're coming to pray for. But if the Spirit of God has laid on your heart to respond publicly, we'll do so. Father in heaven, by your good grace, would you oversee this invitation and every single response to it for our good and the glory of Jesus, in whose matchless name we make our prayer. Amen.